Hello, everybody. It's good to see you all. I'm glad you're all here safe and sound and uh, looking forward to a great 2013 South City Midwinter Roundup. Um, our speaker this afternoon at 3 o'clock is Neil B., who I've known for quite a few 24 hours, and uh, I have never heard Neil's um, story, and, and I, would, I was always curious to hear it because he has been an awesome example to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. He has done, uh, he's on many levels of service work, both on the Roundup Committee area, area and all types of service work in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, he's got a great message at meetings. I always love it when he shares his experience, strength, and hope with us. He's a shining example of Alcoholics Anonymous as far as I'm concerned. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing, hearing his story this afternoon since I have never heard it. But I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot about him and, and learn a lot about ourselves. And we can all identify with him on some level, I am sure. So I would like you all to warmly welcome Neil B., uh, Syracuse, New York, our opening speaker. Oh, what am I going to do with an opening like that? She must have been talking about uh, Neil B. in the program, N-E-I-L-B. I don't know who that is. Mine is N-E-A-L, but anyway. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the 26th uh, annual Salt City Midwinter Roundup. And I would like to thank the committee and particularly uh, Elizabeth for this moment to be able to reflect and share from you some notes uh, that I, God and I collaborated on to briefly outline my path on the way to sobriety with you today. Now, I am a recovered alcoholic and my name is Neil. And I say that I am a recovered alcoholic because in the foreword to the first edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, it states, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And recovered, I want to assure you that I have, uh, have recovered from that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Although there are occasionally a lot of um, potholes in this road and on this journey that I'm traveling today. I celebrate my sobriety date, May the 15th, 1985, which today is 10,131 days. And to save you the math, that's uh, 27 years, eight months, and 24 days. Thank God for the uh, internet and Google. <laughs> My home group is the Fayetteville Group. We would love to have you share with us in the fellowship of the Spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous, which meets every Tuesday night at 8.30 p.m. in the Great Room at the uh, Fayetteville Trinity Episcopal Church in Fayetteville, New York. Unequivocally, I want to state that neither God nor AA can help us if we are not open to help. If you cannot find what I talk about today in either the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous or the good books of the Bible, please ignore it and just chalk it up as my opinion. Nothing I talk about today is new and much of what I will talk about comes from other people who have shared their experience, strength, and hope with me and I want what they have. So I try to do what they do. I can only pass along to you what I have learned from those people that have before me trudged that uh, road of happy destiny. Um, I need to identify and not compare with the people in Alcoholics Anonymous because uh, when I look for the differences, that's usually mean when I'm thinking about myself better than uh, what I, th I think of others. In the foreword to the uh, third edition, it states that each day, somewhere in the world, recovery begins when one alcoholic talks with another alcoholic, sharing their experience, strength, and hope. And it also states in the fifth chapter that our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. So in a, a brief summary, fear 
is uh, false evidence that appears real. And I was a lonesome kid who uh, felt that I was not loved enough or appreciated enough by my mother and father. That was fear. They did the best they could with what they had. During the first part of my life, I showed little affection for my own family. I did not feel close to my family. I was a young man whose uh, disposition was to go it alone. And go it alone I did. All through school, I did not make close friends. That was fear. There was a wall between me and other people. Fear. I did not go halfway to make friends, and there was no love in my life. Fear. In fact, true love was a great mystery to me. As a child, I never felt loved, and as a result, I never learned to truly love others. I was poorly adjusted to life, being self-contained, egocentric, immature, easily hurt, and overly sensitive. In reflection, fear is the thread that was woven throughout my, the entire fabric of my life. In other words, to paraphrase, you know, our stories disclosed in a general way, our experience, strength, and hope. I was born in Toledo, Ohio in uh, 1944. And we moved to El Paso, Texas when I was uh, approximately uh, four days before my fourth birthday. My dad had a uh, serious lung condition that caused the uh, removal of one lung. At that time, they didn't have the medications that they do today. So therefore, we went to a dry climate. The choices then were either um, Hot Springs, New Mexico, or El Paso, Texas. I have absolutely no clue why I picked El Paso, Texas. Hot Springs, uh, New Mexico later became uh, Truth or Consequences for Bob Barker. A couple of little known facts you may not know about El Paso, Texas. Uh, Clan Clancy I, one of our um, well-spoken circuit speakers that travels the road, happened to be a newspaper man in uh, El Paso, Texas there for a period of time. Also, uh, Henrietta Cyberling, who brought together our co-founders, uh, Dr. Bob and Bill, up in Akron. Her dad was a um, judge down in El Paso, Texas, so she spent some time there. Anyway, before the uh, era of easy open pop tops, my brother and I took turns opening my dad's beer cans with a church key, for those that might remember what a church key is. It was an honor, and occasionally it got rewarded with stolen sips, you know. My father was a traveling salesman, and often on road trips. My first drunk was one lovely warm summer afternoon when my mom had planned a backyard picnic and had gone to the store shopping. The jug of Mogan David wine in the refrigerator looked mighty inviting. I reasoned a couple of sips would not be detected. One trip to the refrigerator turned into many returns to the watering hole. My dog and I had quite a philosophical conversation on the lawn that day. <laughs> Upon my mom's return, the jig was up, as well as the jug of wine. <laughs> My mom wailed the tar out of me, but I was so drunk, I was impervious to the pain. I was one sick puppy that night with many, 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 many promises to never repeat that experience. But the basic cycle was to repeat itself over and over again in my life. Moderation prevailed during a, due to basically a lack of supply through grade school years. Through uh, high school, there occurred many occasions to indulge with purchases from the small store in the valley where anyone, any age, could get three quarts of Falstaff for a buck. Man, have times changed. <laughs> Occasional uh, weekend parties in, involved uh, rum, bourbon, and scotch purchased uh, from short trips across the uh, Mexican border. I felt the uh, border guards were quite aware of it, absolutely everything that was going on, but they didn't want to be bothered with some young high school kids. They had bigger fish to fry. 
That was during the uh, high school years. And then college, come college there. Um, turned out to be bigger and better parties. My first semester there, I, I drank, got drunk, and learned to shoot pool. I never was very good at shooting pool, but I certainly excelled at drinking and getting drunk. Of course, I was placed on academic uh, probation, suspension, for the next semester there. And this was a big deal because of the Vietnam War and the draft at that period of time. The next semester, I was able to stay focused for about half the semester. And actually, I was doing quite well. But I soon, soon returned to shooting pool, drinking, and getting drunk. Again, academic suspension. But because of the possibility of an upcoming draft, I joined the Navy at the age of 21. <clears throat> I could already legally drink. 1966, on a train to San Diego, after being warned not to drink, I was pretty buzzed when I arrived at the Naval, at the Naval Recruit Training Center. Our first celebrity after 12 weeks of boot camp, I was also warned not to drink. Another work hard, play hard scenario. Anyway. I ended up getting out of a boot camp there and we went to school in San Diego, you know, and that was the whole basic uh, idea of being in the service at that time. If you worked hard, you got to play hard. And we did that quite often. I went and I ended up in the submarine service. My first submarine was the USS Hammerhead that was uh, stationed, uh, what well, was getting built in Newport News, uh, Virginia there in the shipyard. And when the Navy builds a ship there, you join it early so that you work together with the uh, shipyard workers, learning the systems, testing them out, so that you became very familiar with uh, all the operations. I stayed with the Hammerhead for about seven years, and of course, uh, most ports that we ever hit, you know, it was work hard, play hard, you know. So in Liberty, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of getting drunk. I had broken service. I got out after seven years because at that particular time, well, I went from the submarine, I ended up over in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and talk about the, um, a, a dream place to go. The unfortunate thing is, no matter where you went on Pearl Harbor there, you'd end up in exactly the same spot two hours later because there was no place to go. You know, It was uh, my first opportunity to find out what it was to be in a minority group there because the, uh, uh, the white people did not own the island, believe me. I got out of the service after seven years there. I went home and I worked with my brother in a, a, a janitorial maintenance service there. Um, he would do the work and we'd uh, get out on some jobs there. Uh, occasionally it would work uh, in the case of uh, if we were cleaning the carpet in a restaurant, unfortunately, is they usually had a bar there. And uh, a lot of times there, he ended up picking me up off the tables afterwards, you know, because I would uh, avail myself of the uh, open bar. During this period of time, I, I uh, became married, and I had my first son in El Paso. My brother liked to go racing uh, Corvettes, and that left me to do the job there. I didn't feel too stable at doing that. I rejoined the Navy, and they let me back in at uh, the rate that I got out at, which was fortunate. I ended up uh, doing a, going to a refresher course in school there, joined another submarine in the uh, shipyard there, the USS Cincinnati, and I was on that for four years, okay? Same thing. We'd go running around the world and all that. Uh, there's probably about six or seven real good books there you can get from the library if you want to read what we did. One of them was by an uh, author by the name of Sontag, you know. Um, I was on the Cincinnati for four years, a lot of uh, uh, going to sea, a lot of hitting ports, a lot of drinking, a lot of carrying on. The fortunate thing about uh, being in the service there is you're usually there only three or four years there, so every three or four years you got to move. So before I could get in any serious trouble, I was on to the next uh, command there. I went from uh, the Cincinnati to the USS Memphis. I crossed the pier there and ended up picking up the Memphis down in Diego Garcia, and I recall getting down there, and the, the uh, 
we went, I had to fly from Norfolk, Virginia, we went to um, L.A., up to, uh, through Alaska, and down to the Philippines there. The funny thing about uh, from the Philippines, you catch a flight into Diego Garcia. Diego Garcia, if anybody has ever watched uh, some of the old uh, uh, clips of a Pappy Boynton kind of thing there, that's what it looked like, an old World War II type base. Anyway, we got into the uh, Philippines there, and we didn't get out of there for three days. The reason being is that the pilots have absolutely uh, uh, all control over their planes there. If they don't like the way it's loaded out, they'll go ahead and uh, uh, hold up the flight there, have them come out, unload the plane, and reload it until they're happy with it. Well, a drink in the, the PI at the uh, uh, Chiefs Club there cost 10 cents. So it didn't take, uh, you can imagine uh, what, what happened to me. I do recall uh, climbing up on, it was a C-5A <clears throat> that flew down to Diego Garcia. <clears throat> And you climb up this ladder there. I don't know how I managed to do that, but I slept all the way from uh, the uh, Philippines to uh, Diego Garcia, and I think that's a flight that takes about 10 hours. You know, so I got pretty buzzed on that one. After the Memphis, I went to shore duty. You know, before I got in trouble on the Memphis there. The only thing is about the shore duty there is they don't like to see their chief petty officers getting drunk in the uh, or being drunk. Uh, in their parking lot when it's time to come in and teach the students and things like that. So the jig was up. They sent me to a uh, U.S. Navy 45-day um, alcohol rehabilitation center there, where <clears throat> basically what they did was uh, they kind of get us cleaned up physically, and at that time there uh, it was not really cool for the sailors, you know, going out in town, being drunk, that kind of thing there. The, uh, um, the ethic of uh, play hard uh, or work hard, play hard there was finally catching up even with the service there. And the great outcry from the civilian population was that the service was going to have to do something about that. So I got caught up in some of that. Went through the 45 days of uh, rehabilitation there because I knew that at that stage of my career it was 18 years. I had about a year and a half left to do. The threat was that he either kicked me out or whatever. And I figured I could play their silly game, okay? I could play their silly game, not drink for a year and a half. When that was done, get out, retire, and no problem. I managed to do that, got out with it, and retired with uh, 20 years of service, day for day. Um, in the meantime, I had two other sons and things like that. I ended up, uh, you know, the, the naval life of being uh, married and on a submarine and uh, the long deployments and things like that. Uh, my wife and I, we divorced, and uh, I had my mother that aided me during that period of time in, in the uh, Navy there. She came up from El Paso and uh, uh, helped with the family. Um, when I got out of the service there, I, I uh, had her pack up and go back home. But I did not think it was fair all the time and uh, trouble that she had sacrificed on my behalf. So I ended up uh, picking up the three boys, and I, we came up to uh, essentially with a little detour through my detour through California up here to um, uh, New York. <clears throat> and I had three boys that I was raising. Um, at that particular time, <clears throat> I wasn't doing a lot of, uh, you know, I'd, I'd done the rehabilitation thing there, whatever. I'd catch a uh, Alcoholics uh, Anonymous meeting every now and then, and I got into New York here. The thing was is that uh, my three boys and uh, me raising them, there they were getting to be a handful and starting to cause some problems. So I heard about this uh, Al-Anon uh, type thing there, that they had Alateens there. And I thought that would be a good opportunity to try and get some assistance for these guys there, you know. Well, lo and behold, next to this Al-Anon Alateen meeting there, there was an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. So I got involved again in Alcoholics Anonymous for a while. <clears throat> I want to point out that um, through the joy of sobriety today, I have control of the majority of my faculties, at least now and that the practice of the principles of the 12 steps leads to habits 
that involve the choice of excellence in conduct, with the excellence being realized somewhere in between our excesses and our defects. A happy medium. In other words, we gain the virtues of the 12 steps. And after essentially 40 years, nine months, and two days, you know, I'd finally come to accept that truly I was an alcoholic, you know. On the first step there, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. And finally, it was coming to fruition there in my heart that I could accept what I intellectually knew. And the virtue of the first step is basically honesty. Some say that it's acceptance and surrender. I like to believe that it's honesty. I was finally honest with myself from that point of view. You know, during that first period of, in uh, rehab down in Norfolk, Virginia, we basically went through the first four, first five steps. Okay, and that was kind of my introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I never had a problem with uh, uh, believing that there was a uh, power greater than myself. I just have to, had to be reminded upon it a little more. You know, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And the virtue of that particular step is hope. You know, I knew that I had some hope. Finally, there in the rehab, there it was made a decision to turn my will, and my life, over to the care of God as I understood Him. And that particular virtue is faith. Some call it open-mindedness. In my case, it was faith because I do believe in a God. I just figured that I didn't have much use for Him before, but come to find out, and through the progress through the rest of the steps there, I began to start to realize how important that decision was. During the uh, period of time, during the, uh, um, the consulars and all that, I was a, uh, a senior chief petty officer. <clears throat> so they kind of waited for me in these uh, group sessions there to wait for me last because there was some other lower rank people in there, first class, second class, so on and so forth there. They saved me for last there because the hard-headed old stubborn grunt, you know, senior chief petty officer of the Navy. Who the hell are you going to tell me what I can do and can't do? You know, I run a submarine. I run a division there. You know, we go out and we chase Russians. We do all those weird, nasty things. Cool. Nobody's going to tell me squat. Oh, well. Thank God that didn't remain to be so. Anyway, they started started at least opening the door for me, you know, because then I had to admit to God, to myself, and to another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. And to tell you the truth, that was not, it was a beginning, okay? It was a beginning because there was a lot more work to do, you know? Um, for basically the first five years of my recovery, I was sober on the fellowship, going to meetings, attending AA meetings, and what I like to call the wall steps that we find. Somewhere somebody put those wall, the steps up on the wall there. The only problem is they forgot to include the directions and what to do with them, you know. So for a long time I had an understanding of the, the uh, steps only to, the, to my level of what I understood the words to mean, you know. Not to the level of the concepts that underlie those words. The wall steps are like the ingredients in a recipe. And what are some of the ingredients for making brownies, for example? You know, we have butter, we have sugar, we have vanilla, we have baking powder, flour, salt, and cocoa powder, right? For a basic brownie recipe. And no, we're not making magic brownies today. If we all went off with just that list of uh, ingredients to make the brownies, we would all end up with a great variety of things. You know, stomach aches, sinkers, or belly bombs. What is critical along with that list of ingredients are the directions which would ensure some consistency and success that we meet our desired goal of making brownies. So there's more to the steps than the words hung up on the wall. The big book is a text to be studied from the beginning. 
And it sounds too simple. And it is too simple. It is often too simple for us who are above average intelligence, above average insensitivity, and we kind of miss the point, looking deeper than where the truth really lies. At meetings, we start at chapter 5, which is like opening up a mathematics book right in the middle there. We have all these formulas, you know. How the heck are we going to figure out how to work those formulas? We have to look at what is our problem, you know. What is our problem? The problem defines the solution. If the problem was if we drink too much, drink less. And I base my understanding on the problem. And my understanding was imperfect, and therefore the solutions that I had early on were imperfect. It was not my real problem, but a symptom of the problem. What is the problem? That is the information that is given to us in the beginning of the big book, starting with the doctor's opinion, okay, before page one. In the original first printing of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, page one started with the doctor's opinion. Nowadays, they put that in the forward. You know, who reads the forward, right? Jump to page one or the last page and see who did it, you know. Dr. Wil Silkworth says that the problem has two parts, an illness of the body and an illness of the mind. What is on that first page of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? Absolutely nothing. The first page is blank. And that is exactly where we start in this program. And that's what I had to do. I had to go back. And I had to start over again because I missed a bunch of that. You know, it was very nice that they led me through the rehab and things like that. But somewhere, just like in, in, when I was growing up, I didn't catch what everybody else seemed to catch. It took me a while. <clears throat> when I'd gotten to, the, uh, um, to, to Syracuse here, I had my boys doing their Alateen and Al-Anon and all, all that stuff there. I discovered that there was a, a place for me, okay? And I discovered that there was a thing beyond the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. There was such a thing as called Area Assembly. You know, I heard something about that. There was some organization that was a little higher up than the meeting place. I wanted some more of that. So what I do? I went and found a group that only had one other member in it. So I went to that group and it says, I'll be a GSR, you know? And that's how I got into service, because I knew if I went, went to a group that had a sizable number of people, I would not get voted in. And you know how that is, you know. We cannot stand rejection. I can't, you know. So that's how I started into service, you know. And I do a lot of it today. And so from that point on, you know, re-going re through the first five steps again and finding a sponsor, you know, I, I do a bunch of, bunch of stuff there. I'm involved in inner group. I'm been previously involved in the roundup there, and you'll hear more about it. Come and be a, a, a committee member uh, through the week there. This, this stuff doesn't get put on by itself, so it takes a lot, of, a lot of people and a lot of hard work. So anyway, now that I lost track of where I was at. I was entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character, and that's virtue. The virtue is willingness, and some say it's patience. But after properly working the first five steps, I have not properly. It's an ongoing process, at least getting through it thoroughly, armed with the right amount of information, beginning from the doctor's opinion. And I humbly ask God to remove my shortcomings. That virtue is humility which I try and practice today, don't do necessarily a very good job about it. You can ask my wife about that. <laughs> She's right up here in the pink, pink sweater. I made a list of all the persons we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all. And that virtue is brotherly love, or some say forgiveness. You know, That was one of the most uh, important things that I learned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
was forgiveness. And the best way to talk about forgiveness was not to tell me to forgive my enemies. That was hard. First, I was told to think about how much forgiveness God had to grant me from my childhood from my childhood up through my adult life. And now I had to make withdrawals from that bank of grace that God so willingly gave me many, many, many times. That was the beginning point. Forgiveness was not possible for me, even if I wanted to forgive, until I could find compassion, compassion that was born in my heart. Forgiveness allows me to let go of the pain and the memory. And it, if I let go of the pain, I can have the memory, but the, the uh, memory will no longer control me. That's what it used to do. When the memory control, controls me, I was a puppet of the past. But I think that if we all remember to forgive ourselves, and forgives ourselves first, it is a wonderful beginning to forgiveness. Actually, if we really forgive ourselves of all the ugliness we have caused or think we have caused or wrong with ourselves, it is really a big step towards compassion towards others. And our lack of compassion towards others is what makes us so upset with them. Forgiveness is something that you do for yourself. You don't do it for someone else. Say a prayer and bring God into it. I have a lot of trouble of letting go. So forgiveness is a journey of making my life easier, not someone else's easier. I hope you can do the same. If I can forgive myself, I can be unburdened to forgive someone for what I perceive as an insult to me. It's become much easier today. If I can learn, I will be less burdened. I understand all that, but understanding it and doing it are two way different things. I have trouble with it, but I continue to work on it. So I make direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And that virtue is justice. Some say it's taking responsibility. And today I try and live in the last three steps there. 10 has continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. And that virtue is perseverance. You know, stick with it. Okay, just because I stumble and stumble my toe on the speed bumps of life there, I have to continue on. And sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and for the power to carry that out. And that virtue is spirituality. And some say awareness or unselfishness, you know. It has a very nice, uh, uh, in the big book there, it tells us exactly what to do on the 11th step, you know, what we do at night when we review our day, you know. What we do in the me morning when we ask God what we can do for our fellow human being, and what we do throughout the day if we become restless, irritable, and discontent, you know. In essence, basically our 24-hour day plan is what step 11 is. And 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And that virtue is service. And some say it's love. You know, I'm kind of at a toss-up between the two because love, you know, St. Paul even said, you know, about faith and a few other things and love. And he said the most important of them all is love, you know. And he talks about that on one of the 80s pages. Love and tolerance, you know, that is our code, you know, love our fellow men. Okay. Now I'd like to close uh, from a daily reading from the uh, Around the Year with uh, Emmett Fox. Emmett Fox is a, um, was a spiritual teacher there in the mid uh, in the early 1900s there um, his secretary was the mom of a um, fellow that was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in New York City and they used to go 
listen to Emmett Fox quite often at the Hippodrome in New York City. He also wrote a book, I guess you, I would call it, I like to call it an interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount because the book, book's title is Sermon on the Mount and Emmett Fox did not write the Sermon on the Mount, okay? I want to make that perfectly clear, okay? So he has an interpretation of it. And that was a reading that uh, many of our early AAs and co-founders read, and it's a very good book. I highly recommend it. You can get it at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, whatever, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Anyway, he has a book of uh, uh, daily readings here, and today is the 39th uh, Julian date, and it's Thy Will Be Done, okay? It says, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, and that comes from Matthew 6.10. Now we too often choose to use our free will in a negative way, allowing ourselves to think selfishly, and this wrong thinking brings upon us all our troubles. Instead of understanding that it is our essential nature to express God, to be ever about our Father's business, we try to set up our own account. We abuse our own free will, trying to work apart from God, and the very natural result is all the sickness, poverty, sin, trouble, and death that we find on the physical plane. We n must never for a moment try to make plans or ar arrangements without reference to God, or suppose that we can be either happy or successful if we are seeking any other end than to do His will. Our business is to bring our whole nature as fast as we can into conformity with the will of God. In His will is our peace, said Dante, and the Divine Comedy is really a study in fundamental states of consciousness. The Inferno represents the state of the soul that is endeavoring to live without God. The Paradiso, representing the state of the soul that has achieved its consciousness, conscious unity with the Divine Will. It was this sublime conflict of the soul which wrung from the heart of the great Augustine the cry, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find themselves in thee. Thank you.